All right, hello everyone, and welcome back to the Aquarium of the Pacific's Online Academy. My name is Dana. I'm a member of the Education Department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, coming to you live from Long Beach, California today. Now, today's programming is all about ocean exploration, which is really exciting because we're going to talk about ways that you and I can explore our oceans, um, whether we're there in person or whether we're just exploring using other resources or what our options are. So in order to do that, um, we're going to start by talking about exploration. What exactly is that? Then we're going to transition into all the different top topics that you can explore uh, regarding the ocean. And then we'll end by maybe addressing how we can explore the ocean, right? So we'll kind of touch on a couple of different options there. Now, throughout this programming, if you're joining live and you want to participate and ask questions, which we highly encourage, we do have this phone number right here, which is 562 286-1838. And if you have questions or comments or observations that you want to send in, uh, please go ahead and do so throughout our live programming. Now that live program time is Pacific Standard Time and Tuesday, July 7th. How is it July already? At one in the afternoon. Now, if you're watching outside of the 1 to 1.30 window, we do ask that instead of texting us in your question, we want to make sure that we see it and that we get to it. And we're not always at our, our question station. So that's when this email address comes into play. And that's going to be live at lbaop.org. All right, everyone. So now that that's out of the way, do remember that texting rights apply. So you want to make sure that you have adult permission before joining us and sending in your, your questions or um, observations. Otherwise, let's get started. So what exactly does it mean to explore something? What do you think? I know normally when we teach our ocean exploration class, we're talking about deep sea exploration and, you know, how did we discover about, and, uh, about our deep sea. But like I said, today we're focusing about you and I. So when you hear the word explorer, what do you think about? Hmm. Ah, yeah, I think about making observations, looking around, right? We always talk about exploring with our eyes. We can look at things. Are there other ways to explore without using your eyes? Hmm. Can you explore with sound? Okay, close your eyes. Be really quiet. Let's just listen for a moment. What do you notice about your surrounding area just by listening? I'll tell you what. I hear the lorikeets. So I know that this door is open, the next door is open, and the door to the outside is open because I can hear the lorikeets outside. Now, the Aquarium of the Pacific is open right now just in our outdoor areas, and our lorikeets are one of those areas. So there's guests out there exploring them with their eyes. We're just listening. What else can we listen for? Hmm. Okay. I hear a lot of like noises. And that tells me that the air conditioning is on. Yeah, so you can learn a lot about your environment just by listening. How else can you explore? What do you think? Hmm. Touching. That's right. So in some places, if you're very careful, you can touch things. For example, here at the aquarium, we often encourage people to touch our otter fur. 
right here with the back of your hand so that the oils on your skin don't mess with it, you can feel what that looks like. Now, as I feel this, I notice that it's really, really soft. And that softness uh, can actually tell me that it's a really thick fur. In fact, sea otter fur is the thickest fur of all of our animals. And so just by touching it, oh, there's a great picture of one. So that's one of our southern sea otters there. You can see that the fur is nice and thick, just like that with the back of my hand. So that was by touching. I was able to make observations. Now, like I said, we're going to be exploring different resources, resources that we have because we might not always be able to look in person. We might not always be able to hear what we want to explore, and we can't always touch it. So we're going to have to find some other options as well. Now, what else does it mean to explore? So we said look, right? Listen, feel, making observations. And that's also really important is that you share your observations, even if it's as simple as, hmm, hey, Cynthia, Cynthia's controlling the computer. I'm kind of cold. Did you notice that? And Cynthia's back there like, yeah, I noticed that too, right? So we shared observations and it's as simple as that. So if you're hanging out with a family member or a friend today, make sure you're sharing your observations or text them in to us. We'd love to hear what you notice as we explore our ocean here in a moment. What else can we do? We share observations. Mm, we ask questions. Explorers always ask questions. So you might notice something and then say, well, gee, I wonder why that sea otter fur is so thick. Well, then we can explore a little bit deeper and we can actually discover that sea otter hair is so thick because it keeps the animal warm. So sometimes you have to look for other options or other resources to get that answer, but coming up with the questions is just as important. So now that we've talked a little bit about how to explore, right, as far as like what it means to be an explorer, you're going to look, you're going to listen, you might feel things, you're going to excuse me, make observations, you're going to ask questions. These are all things that help you explore and discover more about the habitat that you're interested in. Now we're going to talk about what exactly in the ocean can we explore. Well, let's let Cynthia show anything she wants on the screen behind us, and we'll see if we can explore it together just by looking at it. Ooh, I love this. Now, some of you, when I said we're going to explore the ocean, you might have been picturing a sea animal. But my friends, there is more than just the animals to explore. For example, this behind me is a kelp forest habitat. This is a home where animals might live, but in this, um, in this image, we don't see any of the animals, right? We're just seeing the home. So what can we explore about this? Well, we can look, we can make observations, we can ask questions. For example, one of the things I notice is that there's a lot of light shining through. So I wonder... What, how, what the depth of this, this image is, right? How deep are we? How deep can light shine through? Wow, those were intense questions. And those are not things that I can discover just by looking at this image. That's where the other resources might come into play, and we'll get there. Okay, so do animals call this area home? Let's see if we have any animals in this habitat that might call it home. Oh my gosh, look at that. So here you see that there's sea lions involved. So not only can we explore the habitat that we are interested in, but we can also take a closer look at the animals that call it home. Now you might learn that you really love coral reefs and that's great. Learn as much as you can about them. But as you learn about coral reefs, you might learn that you really, really, really are interested in one specific fish that lives in coral reefs. And then you can dive a little bit deeper and explore that fish. So the more you explore, the more your interest starts to expand, okay? So we can explore habitats, we can explore the animals. Can you all think of anything else about the ocean that we can explore? Hmm. What about the chemistry of the water? I know that's kind of intense, but you can check out the salinity. You can discover how salty water is versus fresh water, right? Maybe you can look at the temperature. Well, in a tide pool habitat, which is right along the coastline, is the temperature in that pool hot or cold? That's something you can explore and discover, right? So these are all really great options that you can look a little bit more. Ooh, you can, you can study the waves, right? You can ask questions about the waves. How often do waves come and hit our shore? Well, there's actually buoys in the ocean that tell us that information. So there's a lot we can discover. You just have to find what interests you. Now, for the next 20 minutes or so, we're actually going to chat about how you and I can explore our oceans. And we're going to start right where you are right now. So look down. Look next to you. 
Is there an ocean nearby? No? That's okay. So remember I said that sometimes we don't have the opportunity to be there in person. We don't have the opportunity to look, listen, and feel. So instead, we have to explore other options. Now, this is where I want to introduce resources to you, right? So just sitting where you are right now, you can look around and see what resources do you have. Do you have someone else in the room? There you go. That's a resource to explore. You can ask questions and bounce ideas off of each other. Do you have a computer or do you have a library that you can go to? Those are also resources that you can explore the oceans with. I encourage you all to watch documentaries, to read books, to remember that fish that you wanted to learn more about in the coral, uh, coral reef and, and look it up. Right? Now, when we're doing that, we want to make sure that the sources we're exploring are are um, trustworthy sources, right? It's called citing your source and, and explore and discovering whether or not that's a trustworthy source. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're not just reading some post that your friend, you know, posted online because we don't know where they got it. Instead, you can look it up for yourselves. In fact, I find myself doing that a lot when I read things about marine science. There'll be like this big headline and then I'll say, well, hmm, I wonder a little bit more about that and I wonder how they discovered that. So then I might actually search some stuff myself. So it's a really great way to learn more about our habitats and our animals and our physical oceanography and our chemical oceanography. You can search for days and cover any topic that you're interested in. So whether or not you're sitting at home and you have access to the internet or whether or not you can go to your local library, um, those are options that you have to explore your ocean and your ocean animals. Now, what if we do have the opportunity to go out on or in the ocean? Hmm. I know in a lot of our ocean exploration programs, we talked about uh, the big boats and research vessels and, and ROVs, right? Remotely operated vehicles, which again are great. But you know what that takes a lot of? Time and money, which we don't always have. So instead, we're going to look for options that can just get you out of your house and out onto the, the beach or onto the shoreline, maybe even in the water. And we can find some ways that you and I, without a research vessel and an ROV, can explore our oceans. So let's think about it. We have one habitat in particular that's really easy to explore, and it's called a tide pool habitat. Cynthia, if you can bring up a tide pool kind of habitat for us to check out. Oh, it looks like we're getting some questions. No. All right. So let's check out the tide pool habitat. Ooh, perfect. Let's go ahead and watch this video for a moment. Let's explore together, just you and me. So what do we notice about this video? What, uh, about this habitat, I should say. Oh, okay, I notice there's wave action down there. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, what else do we notice? There's a lot of rock, right? Um, there's, water, there's pools, that's where the name tide pool comes from. Um, I noticed that some of the pools are really small and some of them are a lot bigger. So I wonder if animals are distributed in certain ways. Like, would we find the same animals in these two pools? Or do you think they'd be different sizes, right? Those are all questions that we can now explore. So tide pools are areas that the beach and the ocean meet, okay? And in rocky areas like this, that causes these shallow pools to form when the tide waters come in and out. Now, I like to think of the tide as a wave of water kind of traveling around our earth. And sometimes you're at the, the peak of the wave. Sometimes you're in the trough of the wave or the low part. So sometimes the water's a little bit higher. Sometimes it's a little lower. And this is actually a low tide experience. Now at high tide, all of this rock might be covered. But at low tide, the water is a little bit lower and that's forming these pools. And we are so lucky to live in California because the California coastline has a lot of great tide pool habitats to explore. There's some up along our coast here in um, Southern California, such as I think by Cabrillo. You can go tide pooling in Laguna. You can go tide pooling um, Santa Cruz if you're farther up the coast has some really great tide pools. Um, San Diego has some really good ones down at Point Loma. These are all just areas that I can think of off the top of my head, but really anywhere that you have a rocky area meeting the, be uh, meeting the ocean is a great spot to explore. But how do we do that? Are we just going to walk right through? Right? Probably not. That's a horrible idea. When we go explore areas, we want to make sure that we're being incredibly respectful to that habitat. So the first thing we want to do, respectful to ourselves and the habitat, I should say. First things first, 
you want closed-toed shoes, okay? That's because these rocks can be really, really harsh. They're really sharp. So you want closed-toed shoes. You want to be nice and prepared to go, maybe probably get your feet wet. Um, and so you want to be prepared for your exploration. Some other things that I like to bring when I explore is a magnifying glass, right? Other things, I've brought binoculars before. Um, don't forget, friends, text your questions into 562-286-1838. Um, my phone is actually a really great resource for exploring because then if I find something I don't know, I can look it up right there on the spot, assuming there's service, right? So if I don't have any of those things, really all I need to bring is myself and some safe shoes. And then we're going to carefully make our way across the area and look in all the pools using our eyes. Maybe we can listen, right? Ooh, I hear a lot of crashing waves. Maybe that means we're on a really high activity coast. Well, that makes me think, how do the animals in tide pools deal with waves? That's kind of a lot, right? So then we can watch, we can observe, we can make note of the waves. Now, it does look like we're having some questions coming in and they are tide pool related. I love that. So what kind of animals do you find in tide pools? Great question. So one of the animals that I love finding in tide pools is an anemone. Now, anemones are these creatures right here. This is a giant green anemone. Um, we also get sea stars. We get urchins. It depends how high or how low the tide is and what access you have and, of course, where you are on the coastline. Um, I can guarantee almost that you'll see hermit crabs, that you'll see snails. Okay, so um, I've even found octopus in tide pools. These, again, the ones behind me are very common tide pool animals. Um, these are going to be animals that have adaptations, something on or in their body that helps them survive in an area that dries up, in an area that has a lot of wave action, um, in an area that has to deal with both land and water predators. So you can imagine that they're going to be really um, unique animals with some great, great ways to protect themselves, like our spiky sea urchin, right? or our sea star that has tube feet to hold on. Um, are tide pools safe to explore? Yes, tide pools are safe to explore if you're doing it safely, right? So I mentioned the, the closed-toed shoes. It is sharp rock. You want to be very, very careful. Um, you want to make sure you're not running. It's going to be slippery. You want to make sure that as you move, you're not stepping on animals. You're not putting your hands anywhere that you might get hurt. So again, tide pooling can be safe if you do it safely. There are a lot of resources that you can look up how to go tide pooling. So I encourage you to do that. And of course, we'll also list some areas um, that you can go. Now, are there, spe are there specific times to go to tide pools? Yeah, the best time to go explore a tide pool is going to be at low tide. Now, if you recall, I mentioned that wave, right? So high tide versus low tide. If you go at high tide, the tide pools are covered. So you want to go at low tide. In particular, you want to go at low tide during a full moon. That's the best time. Um, are tide pools in a certain temperature? Good question. This will be the last tide pool question that we take today. Um, but tide pools can be a certain temperature. Um, but I want you to think about it. Let's go back to that image of the tide pools, actually. So we're going to jump back there so that you all can take a look at it. Um, and I want you to think. If you were to have a glass of water, okay, take a glass of water, set it out on a hot, sunny day, that's going to be this smaller pool here. Now, you were to take a five-gallon bucket and set it out right next to the glass of water. Still a hot, sunny day, but this pool right here is the five-gallon bucket, okay? Which glass, or the glass or the bucket, which one's going to get warmer first just based off the sun? Yeah, that's right. Probably the glass. There's a lot less water in there um, that it requires less energy to heat up and warm. So tide pools, even within a tide pool area, can be different temperatures. And that's another thing that animals have to be prepared to deal with is a very intense temperature fluctuation in that habitat. Um, so great question. I love hearing the wheels turn, right? And get those thoughts out of your head. So that's one way we can explore. But what if we're willing to go one step farther? Well, this time we're going to actually take those closed-toed shoes off, all right? Put that bathing suit on and throw on your goggles or a mask, as we call it in the snorkel and dive world. So we can actually go snorkeling or scuba diving. Now, scuba diving takes a little bit more training, a little bit more money, a little bit more resources. But snorkeling can be um, a little bit simpler, right? It's a lot less gear to deal with. And you don't have to deal with the diving down aspect. So a lot of people can go snorkeling. Now, raise your hand if you're from Southern California and you've never been snorkeling before. Oh my gosh, 
Cynthia is raising her hand. We're going to fix that. <laughs> so a lot of us who grew up in California really forget to take advantage of the opportunities right here off our coastline by using our eyes and our ears and just exploring, right? So if that's something you're interested in, find a beach that has a great calm area. Now, again, it depends where you are. That can be all over the place. But one of my favorite places is down in San Diego. You can explore by getting in the water and looking around. In fact, do you have that sea lion video again? There are even, sometimes you might be like, well, if I'm snorkeling, like, what am I going to see, right? We've seen sea lions while snorkeling before because they're a very coastal animal. If you want to pull up some other coastal uh, marine fish that we have here, uh, we'll take a look at them as well. So you can see a lot of animals while snorkeling. A common habitat to snorkel, oh, hello, fish, um, is that kelp forest habitat that we were just looking at because we are very fortunate to have it here in um, California. This is the fish, oh, <laughs> This is a fish that you will, um, I would almost put money down that you would see if you were to go snorkeling here in Southern California. This is actually our state fish, our state marine fish. This is called the Garibaldi. Now, the Garibaldi is bright orange. It really stands out. It's really only about this big. Okay, I know as a fisherman, that's like, it's this big, right? No, so my fingers are right next to my shirt. Okay, so it's about that big to give you kind of an idea. Um, and they're very territorial fish. They're not afraid of snorkelers at all. They'll actually oftentimes come right up to you. They're concerned that you are in their territory. Now, um, so this is a common one. Any other ones that you can think of? Are, oh, this one. Now, this is a giant sea bass. I've never seen one snorkeling, but I know people who have. In fact, oh wait, have I? I have, I have seen one snorkeling. Now I was out at the Channel Islands, but it was very shocking because I was actually with a group of, um, of teenagers and they saw it before I did. And I was like, there's no way, there's no way. Because usually these fish like to hang out a little bit deeper, more in the 30 to 60 foot and even uh, much deeper than that range. But this giant sea bass had come right up towards us to kind of see what was going on. There was a big commotion, right? So, um, I wouldn't guarantee this, but this is an example of an animal that lives off our coast. Now, if you're learning about it and you're like, holy moly, I want to discover more about the giant sea bass. Well, there you go, friends. Jump back to our first option for exploring and you can use the internet. You can use the library and look up more about that. In fact, um, the Aquarium of the Pacific's website has some really great information about our giant sea bass. And we have a lot of cool things that you can learn and discover just by exploring that one resource. All right. So, Lots we can do while um, snorkeling. Now to do that, like I said, you're going to need a bathing suit. You're going to need a mask and you're going to need a snorkel. And you might need fins. Fins help us move through the water a little bit better. Even if you're a really good swimmer, the ocean has a lot of movement going on, right? It's actually called surge. And it can push you back and forth and it's kind of going like this, just like those out that kelp was in the very beginning. And so there we go. We want to find a way to kind of push through that, right, without getting too exhausted. Now, like I said, if you're willing to take it one step deeper and you get the training and you get the certification and you get all the gear, you can always go scuba diving as well. In fact, that's me. <laughs> um, in fact, as you're diving, you can get a little bit closer to some of our animals. You can get a little bit closer to some of our habitats, right? As a snorkeler, you're not going to be reaching a 60 foot habitat. It'd be very impressive, but for the most part, you're going to be staying in that upper level and skimming the surface. Now, there's also free diving, which is like snorkeling um, that involves a little bit more breath control and diving down into the water. So there are options out there if you're not interested in the diving gear. Um, but last but not, oh, not last but not least, but another option we have if you're interested in exploring our area is getting out on a boat right? So there are a lot of whale watch excursions. There are harbor tours. If you want to learn more about um, exploring and discovering what kind of goes on in our harbor, um, there's so many ways that you can get out and on and in the water without having to have that research boat like I talked about, right? All it takes to be an explorer is asking questions, making observations, maybe chatting with your neighbor and sharing those observations, right? So what we're going to do to end this um, is we're going to talk a little bit. Oh, actually, there's one more thing I want to touch on. Sorry there. Um, another way we can explore, I mentioned the ROVs or remotely operated vehicles before. Um, but usually we think of a research boat. We think of a really big ROV. There's actually material online that can teach you how to make your own. Now, it's a lot. It's very technical. 
But if that's something that you're like, yeah, I understand computers, I understand electricity, I understand, you know, technology and all of that stuff, you can actually learn to make your own. And um, I've played with one before and I've driven it around a pool. And then I drove it around in a very shallow part of a beach before. Um, and you can explore just like that. So my friends, what I want to mostly encourage you to do through this program is use your resources, right? If you can't get out there and see it in person, learn what else is around you. Now we're going to end um, by kind of exploring some of our favorite things to talk about here at the aquarium. And so I'm going to let Cynthia bring up one of her favorite things to explore. And she's going to put me on the spot here, kind of like I just put her on the spot. Whatever your heart desires. She's looking at me like, what do you want? <laughs> what do you like to explore? Aha! There you go. See, this is one that I would never have chosen, right? So that's kind of the, what I meant when you talk about like the interests that you want to learn more about. Now this right here is called a crystal jelly. And I know a lot about some jellies, but I might have to learn more about others. So what I know about this jelly is they're pretty small. Okay. And like, right? Pretty tiny. And they actually have pretty long tentacles for their body size. Um, you can see that they're clear, right? The lighting in this photo makes them seem a little more intense, but they're clear animals. And if I wanted to learn more about them, if I wanted to explore, am I going to go swimming with one? Probably not, right? But instead, can I watch a documentary about one? Yeah. Can I look at the aquarium's website and learn a little bit more about one? Definitely, right? Are there other resources that I can do without having to get in or on the water to see one? In fact, for crystal gel, correct me if I'm wrong, um, we'd have to travel to go see one, right? <laughs> so um, sometimes we might be interested in an animal that's not nearby and we'd have to learn a lot more about it um, just through reading and, 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 and discussing it and watching videos and using those other resources, right, that I mentioned. Um, for example, I know one of my favorite animals is the beluga and they're not really around here, okay, except for last week there was one. Yes, I said that. You heard that. There was a beluga spotted in San Diego last week. It was very weird. We're still learning a lot about it. But um, for the most part, I'd have to travel up north to really cold waters, and that's just not an option for me. So how do I learn and discover more about belugas? Well, I'm going to look at books. I'm going to look at our online resources. I'm going to ask questions, right? So it's all about figuring out what you are interested in. Now, um, are there any questions coming in out there? No questions coming in, but that's okay. So friends, we're going to be wrapping it up here in just a couple of minutes. But what I want to encourage you to do is find that thing that interests you. What do you want to know more about? What are you interested in discovering? What are you wondering about the ocean? Maybe Cynthia can throw up one more animal and we'll do another example. Aha! Ooh, this is a fun one. Okay, so this, what do we know? All oh, right, so this is a great white shark. Well, there's my first question. Why do we call them great white sharks? Tickle his little chin. You can see this white spot right here? So he's got a great white belly, right? So that's actually really cool. Um, we can look at it. We can ask why it has that name, and then we can learn. And then it can actually lead us into a different topic. The great white belly on our great white shark um, is opposite a darker back. It's called counter shading. Now we are able to discover that and get to that topic just by exploring this shark and looking at it. So counter shading is when you have a light color on the bottom, dark color on top. And that's because if I were to look down on this animal, the dark back is actually going to blend in with the dark water down below. Now if I were swimming underneath the great white shark, oh, that'd be so cool looking up, right? The white belly is actually going to reflect just like the light coming in on the surface. So it's going to blend in a little bit more. Now that might be confusing because it would also be blocking the light. So there'd be like the shadow, right? Um, but that's kind of how it works with the counter shading, um, blending in with the lighter surface and the darker bottom. Now what else can we learn or ask about this shark? Okay, let's think. Why is its eye... So, um, I was looking the wrong way, wasn't I? <laughs> Why is its eye so just like dark, right? It's not blinking. Okay, so my question is, why don't sharks blink? Well, then I might have to use some other resources and I would learn that their eyes don't have eyelids. Sharks like this have a nictating membrane, which is like 
a cover that can cover their eye, but it's not like an eyelid like you and I, okay? Um, they use it to protect their eyes when they're about to um, go after prey. What else can I question and discover? Hmm, I'm blocking it a little bit, huh? Well, what are these? Okay, I know sharks are fish, so they don't have lungs. So these are gills, right? Now, sharks have one, two, three, four, five gill slits. That's right. So um, I can discover that just by looking, right? And asking questions and counting. So my friends, I hope you enjoyed exploring with me today and also learning a little bit about what it means to explore. Sometimes when we think of exploring the oceans, we go a little bit above and beyond our capacities. But when you kind of... Uh, Feel it back in, like on my ocean punts. Um, you can learn a little bit more about how you can explore closer to home, right? So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it opened your eyes to some of your resources out there, some of your op uh, options that you have to learn more about our ocean habitats, more about our ocean animals. If you have any last questions, we'll be wrapping up the chat line here in a moment. Um, otherwise, you can email your questions to live at lbaop.org. That's going to be right down here. So thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful Tuesday afternoon. We will be back here at 2 o'clock today talking about food webs. All right. We'll see you at 2. And uh, once again, thanks for joining us, everyone. Bye-bye.